something which many Muslims nowadays need to learn, particularly the fanatical Wahhabis and Salafis of the world who are funded and supported by Saudi Arabia and all the Gulf countries. These Wahhabis and Salafis have given the world the worst impression about Islam. In the Prophet's treaty with the Christians of Najran, an analytical study to determine the authenticity of the covenants, published in 2016, Ahmad al-Wakil, a Qatari-based scholar of Egyptian origin, asserts that the compact, namely the version of the Treaty of Najran, transmitted through Muslim sources, was derived from the covenant, namely the version of the Treaty of Najran, transmitted through Christian sources, but modified to the Muslims' advantage while trying to accommodate the stipulations of the original document. While the covenant was intended as a bilateral agreement whose language is characterized by that of cooperation between people, the compact has the tone of an authoritative edict issued by a Muslim ruler engaged in statecraft. This troubling argument is bolstered by Baladuri's apparent lack of credibility. As El Wakil establishes, in the same way that he claimed that the Jewish compact was an exact replica of the Jewish covenant, Al Baladuri also claimed about the Najran compact that it was handed down to him from Al Hussein, from Yahya ibn Adam, who said, I copied the statement of the Prophet to the people of Najran from that of a man who took it from Al Hassan ibn Saleh. This no doubt lends support to the argument that the compact with the Christians of Najran was a corruption of the original covenant given by the Prophet to the Christians of the region. Although scholars like Louis Massignon, J. M. Fier, and Jean-Michel Mouton have alleged that the long version of the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran that is found in the Chronicle of Sirt is a forgery, the existence of long, medium, and short versions of the same document does not demonstrate that it is not genuine. The Constitution of Medina, for example, is found in an abbreviated format in Abu Ubaid's Kital al-Amwal, and in a fuller form in Ibn Ishaq's Sirah. This is not an unusual phenomenon in Hadith studies, where the same account has reached us in various forms. At times, the shorter versions are condensed versions of the complete version. At others, the fuller versions contain commentary and context. There are also cases where texts have been expanded upon. Variations in account are expected in historical testimony. Some narrators will provide a synopsis. Others will go into great detail. Some will suppress certain aspects. Others will stress certain points. However, they are all relating different visions or interpretations of the same event. If witnesses say the same exact thing word for word during an investigation or in a court of law, one must suspect that the testimony was staged. One expects variations when it comes to historical transmission. When faced with a questionable document, there are three types of authentication. Proof that the document comes from a credible person, comparing the document to another document of genuine provenance, and external evidence such as chain of custody. Like the other covenants of the Prophet, the covenant of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of Najran was first published by reputable and early Muslim and Christian authorities. Its content is consistent with covenants considered to be authentic, and finally, it has a sound chain of transmission and custody. In terms of historical reliability, the covenant with the Christians of Najran is convincing and stands next to the Sinai covenant in terms of trustworthiness. As Ahmed al wakil concludes, if the Chronicle of Sirt was able to preserve an authentic covenant of the Prophet and an authentic covenant of Umar, then there seems to be no valid reason for the author of the Chronicle to have forged the exordium. Since the covenant of the Prophet with the Christians of Najran agrees in its terms and conditions with other covenants, and because the Prophet's interaction with the Christians of that region is a historical fact, there is no reason to deny the covenant's authenticity. I repeat, 
there is no reason to deny the covenant's authenticity. So, to give an overview of what we have learned today, we have seen that the Treaty of Najran or the Covenant of Najran is attributed to the Prophet. Obviously, he considered it to be authentic. The companions of the Prophet also abided by these rights and privileges and protections that the Prophet had granted to the Christian communities. We know that Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali all abided by the covenants. The covenant appeared in Muqatil ibn Sulaiman al-Balhi. He felt it was authentic. Ibn Ishaq said it was authentic. Waqidi, Abu Yusuf, Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani, Yahya ibn Adam, Abu Ubaid, Ibn Hisham, Ibn Saad, Ibn Zanjawe, Abu Dawood, Habib the monk, Baladuri, Yaqubi, the Chronicle of Sirt, Sheikh al-Mufid, Abu al-Futu al-Razi, Fahraddin al-Razi, Bar Habreis, all of them said that the document was genuine. Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziya, Ibn Kafir, Maris, Qalqashandi, Amrus, Giuseppe Simonio Asemani, Abdul al-Mahmoud al-Suhrawardi, all said that it was genuine. But you'll note how things change in the 20th century. And you will notice that the names change as well. Louis Shecho, Christian, said it was apocryphal. Adai Sher, Christian, he says it's fake, we don't believe it. Eugène Cicéran, Christian, he said it's fake. Lawrence Edward Brown, fake. Louis Massignon, it's fake. Mohammed Hamidullah, he was a Western academic. He was an, also an Adam. He thinks the Muslim version is authentic and that the Christians expanded upon the Christian version. But nonetheless, he thinks the long version is genuine in spirit. Uh, Antoine Fatal, Joseph Hajar, Fier, Armand Abel, Louis Massignon, Claude Cahen, all Western Orientalists. Fake, 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 fake. We don't believe that Islam is a religion of peace and mercy. <laughs> Muhammad, you're seeing a pattern here. All right, what we have up to that point is called consensus or called ijma'a, and it was a consensus that was shared between Muslims and Christians. Okay, but now the world has gone totally secular. All right, uh, we have some scholars, Muhammad Sidi Qureshi, he says it's authentic, Abu Muhammad Ordoni, authentic, Segondino Gata, fake, Renaud Lacoste, fake, Claudio Giulio, it's fake, Vrej Nerses, Nersesian, fake. Fake. Muhammad Amara, Egyptian scholar, he says it's authentic. Harun Yahya, Turkish scholar, he says it's authentic. Adil Salahi, biographer of the Prophet, he says it's genuine. Batye Or, if you know who this person is, you won't be surprised why she feels that it's fake. David Grafton, it's fake. Philip Wood, it's fake. Jean-Michel Mouton, it's fake. André Popescu Bellis, it's fake. Laurent Olivier Mallet, it's fake. Barbara Regima, fake. David Wilmhurst, it's fake. James Howard Johnson, it's fake. Milka Levi Rubin, it's authentic. Ah, praise the Lord, an objective Orientalist, and a Jewish one at that. God bless her. Alejandro Garcia San Juan, he's neutral. He doesn't want to, he wants to, yeah. Now, as for myself, I've published many studies on this covenant. In 2013, 15, and 17, I have argued that it is genuine. Hundreds upon hundreds of scholars have signed the Covenants Initiative, which calls upon Muslims to abide upon the treaties and covenants that the Prophet concluded with the people of the book, the, you know, signed by ulama, intellectuals, activists, so over 300 of them. They all say that it's authentic. Samuel Hugh Moffat, he says, it's possible. Okay, I'll take that over apocryphal or spurious. Yasin Jiburi, he says it's authentic. And Ahmed al-Wakil says that it's authentic. All right, how are we doing for time? We're okay. So I will continue a little bit, okay? Uh, Fred Donner, um, no, to my knowledge, he has not commented upon this. Um, but I would, you know, I would invite him to, to join the debate and dialogue in an open-minded way, by all means. Professor Marona, is there a 
version, the short and medium and long. They're all in that book. Mm -hmm. So. Now you can judge for yourself. But first I need a bit of water. So here is the version that was found in the House of Wisdom in the ninth century by Habib the monk. Okay, so this was a repository of all of the knowledge from the Muslim world. This is what it reads. In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. This document has been provided by Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib, the messenger of Allah to all of humanity, who was sent to preach and to warn, who has been entrusted by the trust of Allah among his creatures, so that human beings would have no pretext before Allah after his messengers and manifestation before this powerful and wise being. To Sayyid ibn Harith ibn Qab, his co-religionist, and all those who profess the Christian religion, be they in East or West, in close regions or faraway regions, be they Arabs or foreigners, known or unknown. This document, which has been prepared, constitutes an, author an authoritative contract, an authentic certificate established on the basis of convention and justice, as well as an inviolable pact. Whoever abides by this edict shows his attachment to Islam will be worthy of the best that Islam has to offer. On the contrary, any man who destroys it, breaks the pact which it contains, alters it, disobeys my commandments, will have violated the pact of Allah, transgressed his alliance, and disdained his treaty. He will merit the malediction, whether he is a sovereign authority or someone else. I commit myself to an alliance and a pledge with them on behalf of Allah, and I place them under the safeguard of his prophets, his elect, his saints, the Muslims and the believers, the first of them and the last of them. Such is my alliance and pact with them. I proclaim once again the obligations that Allah imposed on the children of Israel to obey him, to follow his law, and to respect his divine alliance. I hereby declare that my horsemen, my foot soldiers, my armies, my resources, and my Muslim partisans will protect the Christians as far away as they may be located, whether they inhabit the lands which border my empire and any region close or far in times of peace as much as in times of war. I commit myself to support them, to place their persons under my protection as well as their churches, chapels, oratories, the monasteries of their monks, the residences of their anchorites, wherever they are found, be they in the mountains or in the valleys, caves or inhabited regions, in the plains or in the desert. I will protect their religion and their church wherever they are found, be it on earth or at sea, in the west or in the east, with utmost vigilance on my part, the people of my house, and the Muslims as a whole. I place them under my protection. I make a pact with them. I commit myself to protect them from any harm or damage, to exempt them from any requisitions or any onerous obligations and protect them myself by means of my assistance, my followers and my nation against every enemy who targets me and them. Having authority over them, I must govern them protecting them from all damage and ensuring that nothing happens to them that does not happen to me and my companions who along with me defend the cause of Islam. I forbid any conquerors of faith to rule over them during their invasions or to oblige them to pay taxes unless they themselves willingly consent. Never should any Christian be subjected to tyranny or oppression in this matter. It is not permitted to refute to remove a bishop from his bishopric, a monk from his monastic life, an anchorite from his vocation as a hermit, nor is it permitted to destroy any parts of their churches, to take parts of their buildings to construct mosques or the homes of Muslims. Whoever does such a thing will have violated the pact of Allah, disobeyed his messenger, and become estranged from the divine alliance. 
It is not permitted to impose a capitation or any kind of tax on monks or bishops, nor on any of those who by devotion wear woolen clothing, or live alone in the mountains or in other regions devoid of human habitation. Let there be a limit set of four dirhams per year that all other Christians who are not clerics, monks, or hermits need to pay. Otherwise, let them provide one outfit of striped material or one embroidered turban from Yemen. This is to help Muslims and to contribute to the growth of the public treasury. Were cloth difficult for them, they should provide its equivalent price if they themselves willingly consent. May the capitation of the Christians who have income, who own land, who engage in an important amount of commerce by land or by sea, who exploit mines for precious stones, gold and silver, who are wealthy, not surpass as a whole 12 dirhams per year, so long as they are inhabitants of these countries and are residents there. May nothing similar be demanded of travelers who are not residents of the country or wayfarers whose countries of residence is unknown. There shall be no land tax with capitation for others than those who own land, as with the other occupants of inherited properties over which the ruler has a right. They will pay taxes as others pay without, however, the charges unjustly exceeding the measure of their means. As for the labor force which the owners spend upon to cultivate these lands, to render them fertile and to harvest them, they are not to be taxed excessively. Let them pay in the same fashion that was imposed on other similar tributaries. The men who belong to our alliance will not be obliged to go to war with the Muslims in order to combat their enemies, to attack them, and to seize them. Indeed, the members of the alliance will not engage in war. It is precisely to discharge them of this obligation that this pact has been granted to them, as well as to assure them the help and protection on the part of the Muslims. No Christian is to be constrained to provide equipment to a single Muslim in money, in arms, or in horses in the event of a war in which the believers attack their enemies unless they contribute to the cause freely. Whoever does so and contributes spontaneously with the object of, will be the object of praise, reward, and gratitude, and his help will not be forgotten. No Christian will be made Muslim by force, and dispute ye not with the people of the book except by means better. They must be covered by the wing of mercy. Repel every harm that could reach them, wherever they may find themselves, and in any country in which they are. If a Christian were to commit a crime or an offense, Muslims must provide him with help, defense, and protection. They should pardon his offense and encourage his victim to reconcile with him, urging him to pardon him or to receive compensation in return. The Muslims must not abandon the Christians, neglect them, and leave them without help and assistance, since I have made this pact with them on behalf of Allah to ensure that whatever good befell Muslims, it would befall them as well, and that whatever harm befell Muslims would befall them as well. In virtue of this pact, they have obtained inviolable rights to enjoy our protection, to be protected from any infringement of their rights, so that they will be bound to the Muslims both in good and bad fortune. Christians must not be subjected to suffer by abuse on the subject of marriages which they do not desire. Muslims should not take Christian girls in marriage against the will of their parents, nor should they oppress their families in the event that they refuse their offers of engagement and marriage. Such marriages should not take place without their desire and agreement and without their approval and consent. If a Muslim takes a Christian woman as a wife, he must respect her Christian beliefs. He will give her freedom to listen to her clerical superiors as she desires and to follow the path of her own religion. Whoever, despite this order, forces his wife to act contrary to her religion in any aspect whatsoever, he will have broken the alliance of Allah and will enter into open rebellion against the pact of his messenger and Allah will count him among the impostors. If the Christians approach you seeking the help and assistance of the Muslims in order to repair their churches and their convents or to arrange matters pertaining to their affairs and religion, these must help and support them. However, they must not do so with the aim of receiving any reward. On the contrary, they should do so to restore that religion out of faithfulness to the pact of the Messenger of Allah by pure donation and as a meritorious act before Allah and his messenger. 
In matters of war between them and their enemies, the Muslims will not employ any Christian as a messenger, scout, guide, or spy, or for other duties of war. Whoever obliges one of them to do such a thing will harm the rights of Allah, will be a rebel against his messenger, and will, be, and will cast himself out of his alliance. Nothing is permitted to a Muslim with regard to Christians outside of obeying these edicts, which Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the messenger of Allah, has passed in favor of the religion of the Christians. He is also placing conditions upon the Christians. So it's not just a question of here are your rights. Here are your rights and here are your obligations. I demand that they promise to fulfill and satisfy them as commands their religion, among which, among other things, none of them may act as a scout spy, either overtly or covertly, on behalf of an enemy of war against the Muslim. So these Christians, who are allies of the Prophet, must never take the side of the enemies of the Muslims. They are part of the Muslim community, and they must stand together, which is exactly what they did during the Crusades. During the Crusades, the Christians of the Middle East stood side by side with their Muslim brothers and fought the Crusaders. And the Muslims at that time made a very clear distinction. They called the Crusaders Salibis, okay, Crusaders. And the Muslims con considered them to be infidels. However, the Christians of the Middle East were described as our Christian brothers, okay? So, none of them will shelter the enemies of the Muslims in their homes from which they could await the moment to launch an attack. May these enemies of the Muslims never be allowed to halt in their regions, be it in their villages, their oratories, or in any other place belonging to their co-religionists. They must not provide any support to the enemies of war of the Muslims by furnishing them with weapons, horses, men, or anything else, nor must they treat them well. They must host for three days and three nights any Muslim who halts among them with their animals. They must offer them, wherever they are found and wherever they are going, the same food with which they live themselves without, however, being obliged to endure any other annoying or onerous burdens. If a Muslim needs to hide in one of their homes or oratories, they must grant him hospitality, guide him, give him help, uh, and providing him with their food during the entire time he will be among them, making every effort to keep him concealed and to prevent the enemy from finding him while providing for all of his needs. Whoever contravenes or alters the ordinances of this edict will be cast out of the alliance between Allah and his messenger. May everyone abide by the treaties and alliances which have been contracted with the monks and which I have contracted myself and every other commitment that each prophet has made with his nation to assure them safeguard and faithful protection and to serve them as a guarantee. This must not be violated or altered until the hour of resurrection, Allah willing. Thank you very much. Just one question, please. And just a question, not a speech. <laughs>